the biggest threat to these deep sea corals is bottom trawling for shrimp. In the process, a giant net is dragged across the ocean floor, capturing everything in its path. You can imagine these reefs sort of like delicate porcelain bushes, if you will. And uh, if you were to take a bulldozer through a china shop, that's sort of the equivalent of what's happening on these reefs. John has seen firsthand the destruction bottom trawling can cause to reefs. He began his career studying Florida's Oculina banks in the 1970s. During the early years, his submersible dives would take him to spectacular reefs teeming with life. But only a few years later, hundreds of acres of once spectacular coral mounds had been turned into rubble. Today, only 20 acres of intact Oculina reef tract remain. Concerned about the coral's future, John and his colleagues presented their findings to the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council seeking the reef's protection. Eventually, their hard work paid off. In 1984, they enacted the Oculina Protected Area, which was the first marine protected area in the world to protect the deepwater coral. The Oculina Protected Area is 300 square miles. Since 2004, John and scientists from other institutions have gathered data documenting the Lophelia reefs between North Carolina and the Straits of Florida. This information was provided to the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council in hopes that regulations will be put in place to protect these reefs as well. The South Atlantic Fishery Management Council in order to protect these reefs um, has proposed to make these a marine protected area, what they call a HAPC or Habitat Area of Particular Concern. The proposal is to protect all of the known reefs from North Carolina to the Florida Keys, which would cover an area of 23,000 square miles. So it's a huge area and is primarily to protect it from potential destructive fishing methods. So these maps that we're making this week will help to determine exactly where the reefs are and where they're not. So we can leave areas where there's no reef open for fishing and, and protect the areas where we know there's reefs based on the side scan sonar as well as the previous work I've done out here. We want to strike a, a good balance between making sure that fishermen don't lose their livelihoods, so that they have good areas to fish, but at the same time they're not destroying reefs in the process. Most of the commercial fishermen, you know, understand how that coral is providing habitat for the fish and the crabs that live out here. So if we destroy the habitat, we're going to destroy the fishery in the long run. So it's protecting ourselves. Deepwater reefs around the world are being destroyed at an alarming rate. We could lose species that we don't even know that are there that could be the cure for AIDS down the road or cancer. Every time we come out here in the Florida Straits with our submersible, we find new species and quite often new sponges or whatever that have new chemical compounds that we never discovered before. You know, it's going to be beneficial to mankind uh, not to destroy the habitat. You're going to kill, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years of growth for a very short-term gain. So there's one. Once the data from the AUV has been downloaded, the team of sonar analysts gets to work, processing and analyzing the large data sets the vehicle has collected on its dive. That's cool. That's great. Now this, whole, this mound, we knew this was here, we knew that was there, we had no idea this was here. Hmm. Well, this is the side scan sonar data, and essentially shows you, it's like you're looking down on top of a mountain peak, and we found that there, about 
1,800 meters east to west. So each mound is maybe, what, 500 meters in diameter, mm -hmm. something like that. During a first scan of a region, the goal is to cover as large an area as possible to get an idea of the bottom features. Then, on a follow-up dive, operators can program the AUV to return to areas of interest to collect higher resolution data. So what we're going to do on this second dive is, is, is try to get you in a better depth. So we'll see the actual topography. It's probably best for Can you the meet, AUV uh, to go north the, south. Well, yeah, north this south. most interesting part of the reef will be from the peak to the south. So that's where the live coral is. So I want to see that face the best. Once John and his team have decided what seafloor features they want to examine more closely, Mary Ann is reprogrammed and sent on her second mission. Still looking good. John and the crew are energized to have discovered one previously unknown reef on the first dive. This research mission has been over a year in the making, and it is exciting to see the hard work pay off. Well, this is a major undertaking, so um, to bring this kind of technology together and all the personnel and everything, all the expedition logistics, I mean, you're talking millions of dollars. Each of the REMA 6,000 AUVs alone come at a price tag of close to $2 million. But given the huge data sets they can collect in a relatively short period of time, they are actually a very cost-effective way of doing research. Aside from the three major partners in this expedition, additional scientists from the University of Miami and the National Undersea Research Center are also along on the trip to share their expertise as the team covers unchartered territory. Nice. Perfect, grab it. After a few hours, Mary Ann returns with high resolution data of the three coral mounds that showed up on the sonar scan from the previous dive. Based on observations John has made on one of the three reefs during a submersible dive in the past, he is able to make assumptions about the depth and bottom type of the other two mounds. I would imagine uh, we have not been on the second reef yet, but because of the height and the similar topography as this reef, I would bet all of that red is living coral up there. We're gonna take the, uh, the black and white side scan maps, which gives you an indication of how hard the bottom is. You know, you can tell hard bottom from soft bottom, maybe coral rubble from higher relief. So now we can take this map we know what that is, and now we can extrapolate it within this whole 25 square mile area and estimate the percent of the bottom that has living reef versus muddy bottom. And that'll help the agencies like NOAA Fisheries, South Atlantic Fishery Council to determine the boundaries of these protected areas. To further enhance the data, University of Miami PhD student Giago Coher plans to run it through special software called Flatermouse that can create animated 3D images. He has used it in the past to create maps of deep water reefs found between Miami and the Bahamas. Once those guys, they give me the, the files, I can uh, put it into the Flatermouse. I create this shade relief topography and then using a, a special joystick like you have in the video games, we can make those fly through going very close to the surface, the same thing that you're seeing here. So I hope I can do that with the data that you're collecting this week. Yeah. So the swaths would have to be at 160 again. We may have to break out the that, bottom profile. You know, that's weird. That be cool. <laughs> Throughout the mission, the AUVs and sonar crews worked around the clock. They braved rough seas, and the AUVs managed to safely maneuver over high relief bottoms greater than 200 feet tall. After 10 AUV dives and seven days at sea, an exhausted but exhilarated and energized crew returns to shore, having created maps of dozens of reefs, including several that were previously unknown. 
this is the first time any of this has been seen and at a resolution like this. And so, you know, anything could come along here. The stuff that John's looking for, you might run across a Spanish galleon or you might, you, you could find anything out here. And, and uh, it's kind of exciting from that end. Uh -huh. Looks like you hit the mother load. Like, that's oh, oral. That's, that's pretty much everywhere. That is wild. Yeah, that's a big feature. Oh, it's the mission's been going fantastically. We've been getting excellent data, so it's it's very exciting. Much data on deep sea reefs has been collected on this mission and others before it. Now it is up to the regulators to decide whether or not to protect these fragile coral reefs for future generations before it is too late. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.